Hello, everyone. Welcome to our May Cannabis Live. Today, we're going to be talking about how to grow outdoor cannabis, especially how to grow outdoor cannabis in your backyard. It's not too late. We're only here at the coming up on the end of May. We still have time to get plants and put them out side so you can grow your own cannabis at home. So um, thank you so much for joining us. If you're watching us live, we're really stoked to have you. We're live right now on Cannabuzz. So our Cannabuzzers are in our Cannabuzz fam. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a comment below. Let us know you're here. We're also live right now on YouTube and Twitch. So um, make sure to check us out over there if you love those uh, platforms. Before we get too far ahead of ourselves, I want to give a big shout out to our supporting members. We've recently, just recently launched a supporting membership system so people be can um, become monthly patrons, supporters every month, and uh, it's really, really helpful. We have Cannabis Premium and Associate Producers, and both of those uh, groups of people, we love them both, and they're super helpful, and we really want to thank them uh, for supporting us and helping make this possible, helping us uh, create more content and helping just support Cannabis and helping keep Cannabis alive. So I want to give a quick shout out to our associate producers. Here's our thank yous right here. All these folks are our associate producers <clears throat> on Cannabis. So we are super thankful to all these folks that come in at the higher tier level. Um, super thankful to them. And of course, our premium members as well. If you want to check out the full list of um, supporting members, you can go to our website um, at about.cannabis.app. And uh, there's a, a list there that you can, or actually you can open up the menu in Cannabis and see um, thank yous, I think is what it's called in the menu. Um, and you can see our full list of supporting members. So huge thanks to them. Well, thank you so much. We're now officially ready to go. I'm going to bring in our members here, or sorry, our panelists here to the chat. We've got Flower Reef, Dragons, Flame Genetics, JR Token have all joined me. Later, we'll have Seattle Chronics, uh, Chronic Seeds. He's uh, just running a little bit late, so he'll be joining us in a little bit later. But um, JR is my, there we go, JR is over there on our screen. Uh, JR is my co founder here at Cannabis. We started Cannabis together just about two years ago. So um, huge thanks to JR and the whole community for helping make Cannabis possible. Um, JR, thanks for joining me today. Thanks. I'm really stoked. I think this is a good topic and good timing. Uh, a lot of people are uh, getting legislation in their state and they have an opportunity to grow. They might have a little bit of space in the old backyard. So it will be nice to help steer them in the right direction. Definitely. So um, let's have both of our panelists um, introduce themselves um, real quick, and then let's, we can get into our questions, Jr. Yeah. Um, and also, so we've got um, we've got a kind of flow of topics and questions that we'll be going uh, through, and then at the end, um, I'll be selecting questions from the community that we will also answer. So stay tuned for that. If you posted some questions on our posts earlier in the week. Um, I'll be going through those and, and finding stuff to, to go through. But uh, anyways, Flower Reef, thanks so much for joining us. Um, let's have you introduce yourself. You're on Cannabuzz, so uh, let us know your, your username. And then, yeah, let us know who you are as a, as a grower. Okay. So my name is Andrea Flower Reef on Cannabuzz. Um, I'm super excited. This is my first time doing a live. This is, like, super exciting. And I'm super excited you guys asked me. So I'm like not experienced even a little bit. So I'm surprised you guys even asked me, but this is awesome. And I'm in Canada, so I don't know where you guys are. But uh, the weather here right now is freaking awesome, like freaking awesome. So I'm definitely excited and want to take advantage of this season. Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> the reason why I invited you is because I went through our um, outdoor growing group. And this is kind of a secret to how I... Um, I, we always try to bring in panelists from folks that we know and all that whatnot, but we also try to go through our community and I went through our outdoor growing group and you always just have amazing looking plants uh, in the, in the fall um, and like, you know, big greenhouses full of plants. So um, I wanted to bring you on cause I figured you'd have something to say about growing outside. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. 
All right, and let's see. We've got um, Jeff, Dragon's Flame Genetics. I'm going to unmute you. Um, Jeff, thanks for joining us. Let's hear your intro. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so I'm Jeff from Dragon's Flame. Um, I'm the owner, breeder uh, behind DFG. Um, we were originally in California and then moved up to Oregon and did uh, eight years, eight seasons in Oregon. And we've been in Hawaii now. Um, for a little bit over a year just before COVID hit. Um, and I specialize in outdoor mold hardy, fast flowering, um, can take the element genetics as well as, you know, high terpene and uh, strains specific for medical, um, for medical needs. Um, I'm a longtime grower. I've been in the medical traditional market, um, you know, just doing my thing. It's, uh, it's what I love to do. Uh, being in the garden is, you know, where I'm happiest. So, um, you know, I'm really happy to be able to, to share and give back some knowledge from my trials and errors. Awesome. That's what, you know, we're all going through various stages of that. So I appreciate the, the honesty. Yeah. Um, but, um, JR, so we worked together, JR and I worked together to gather some questions and kind of a, a flow of things and, um, JR, you can, you can kick us off. Well, I think the first thing that we, you know, we think about when we want to start our projects are uh, what our legal parameters are, and that is in plant count and, and, and in your area. And so I'd like to ask the um, I'd like to ask the panel to maybe speak on the fact of uh, uh, strategizing your pot size based on your plant count. Because uh, if you have a big plant count, you could maybe have smaller pots. But if you have a a, you know, a smaller plant count, you might want to try to go with bigger pots. Uh, maybe Flower Reef, you could speak on that. It really depends on what you're doing, right? So I work like where there's a greenhouse. So there, that it's a much bigger grow. And so the plants are like directly in the ground there. Um, but here at home, I'm just growing my own in Canada. I don't know what the rules are there, but everyone's allowed to grow four plants. Um, so I'm growing four photo periods outside and they're going to be in 10 gallon pots. So I want them to grow really big. But if I'm growing them in the wintertime inside, they're going to be in a smaller pot, like a five gallon pot, because I want them to stay smaller and they don't need to grow. I want, you know, they don't, I don't need them to grow as large as they can in the winter months inside. But in the summer, I definitely want to take advantage. So I need the bigger, the bigger pots. So maybe you can uh, speak a little bit about the difference between going straight into the ground and being in a pot, what your advantages and disadvantages are. From what I've seen, I feel like um, uh, it's such a big difference because what I'm doing here is just the four, whereas where I work, there's like 300 plus, or that's what it was last year. I don't even know what the number is right now. So you can't move them. Once they're in the ground, you can't move them. You can't do anything. Whereas, so if there's a problem where maybe you can move it from one location to the other in certain circumstances, when they're in the ground, that's not an option. So like if you have bugs or whatever, overcrowding or something like that, and you don't anticipate that in the, like at the beginning, like they are where they are. That's it. It's permanent. So with pots, you can maybe move them around and it could, it just leaves more more room to work with them i feel like excellent that excellent no no that does totally okay. yeah and now jeff could you maybe talk a little bit about uh sun cycles and how much actual direct light do you need to be able to grow in your backyard yeah so you know a lot of strains well most strains the more sun you give them the bigger they're gonna get um you know, sun, the sun is how they're able to conduct photosynthesis. So when they are in, in more sun, they are generally, they are able to be healthier. So I always try to give my, usually when I set up a property, I pick the absolute best full sun spot that I can. That being said, cannabis is very um, adaptable. I mean, I've seen people that are able to pull off crops in fully shade grows. Um, they end up linkier usually and taller. So sometimes you have to be a little bit more aggressive with your training and your trellising because um, they will stretch to try to find that sun. Um, but generally I'd say like six, you know, six to 10 hours of, of full direct sun, you know, that'll, that'll produce some very happy plants that are able to, 
to reach their their maximum size. <clears throat> and I would also I, I would like to touch really quick on the in ground versus pot versus bed, um, just because I've done all three. I will say in the ground, if you are in a spot that is very intense heat in the ground can be a lot more beneficial because the roots aren't cooking in a pot. They're able to spread out and um, they use a lot less water, which we're in a drought year right now on the West Coast. So if you're in the West Coast, putting them in the ground can be um, pretty beneficial because you can mulch and they won't use quite as much water. Downside to being in the ground is you are 100% dependent on what the ground soil is. You could have great soil. You could have clay that is going to resist roots. Um, so that's one of the upsides to pots and beds is you can you can pick what kind of quality soil you want um, and make a you know an exact mix based on your needs. Excellent, excellent. So your average uh, backyard grower is probably going to be looking at um, some kind of a municipal water source. Can you? Uh, uh, maybe flowery. Can you maybe uh, talk about some of the water strategies uh, that you can use uh, in a grow to make sure your plants are getting the best water that they can? So my situation is completely unique. So where I live, it's a really like I'm in the country, a lot of farmland here. And just up the road from me, there's a natural spring and the pH there is perfect. I think it's like, I think 6.25, 6.5. And it's a natural spring, so there's no other toxins in it. So I actually, like, hike my ass up there every day and get water and bring it back. So in my case, not everyone can do that. So I don't really know what else other, everyone else should be doing because this is the resource I have available to me, so I take advantage of it. Um, I'm just trying to think. At the other place, I mean, they just let their water sit like everyone else. The, the tap water, let it sit for the 24 hours in buckets, and then they use that. That's how do you how are you watering do you, do you have like a automatic watering system or do you like are you guys hand watering or how do you do that hand watering everything was hand water so that was a huge pain in the butt so i wasn't i'm not at the big grow so much this year but last year yeah, everything was hose like someone would be there every morning with a hose and would hand water it and the other thing over there they weren't really monitoring the ph so much which i wasn't sure why um, so I do here on my own level, but they still did okay, but they just didn't really monitor and they didn't have a system set up. Everything was done by hand. Yeah, that brings up some good topics, um, with regards to kind of just knowing where your water is coming from, right? So Flower Roof is just talking about how great the local water supply is. Um, you know, for me, where I am um, in, in NorCal, in just my particular city, like I've noticed the water is super high pH. It's like around eight and it's super chlorinated. So I, I do have some issues like when I'm growing in smaller pots. Um, and then what I have done is um, you can buy like uh, chlorine filters that you attach to your hose um, and they last like six months. They're usually rated for like 10,000 gallons or something like that. So I've used that to water um, just my backyard grow, you know. Um, uh, Jeff, do you have any thoughts on um, watering systems and how you water? Maybe you've used automatic watering systems or anything like that? Yeah, so <clears throat> I've had I've had spots I've had great water. I've had spots I've had horrible water. Um, my spot in Cottage Grove um, was super laced with heavy metals and arsenic being the main one. Um, and I will say too, the way you know that is you get a $40 lab test. Um, you know, I would recommend anyone that's, that's going to be growing for their medicine to get a, a water and soil test personally, but so you can even know what's in it. Um, but so at that spot, we had to use reverse osmosis water and everything had to go through an arsenic filter. And so we had to have storage tanks that were, you know, collecting the RO water, um, and then we, you know, we've had to monitor to make sure that all the arsenic was being removed as cannabis is a dynamic accumulator plant. So any, any metal will be in the flowers. Um, and here in Hawaii, we're on catchment, which is rainwater. So here, um, and we're volcanic. So here our pH is incredibly low, but it has a lot of dissolved uh, calcium and sulfur in it. 
Um, so here, as long as we get the pH right, the plants really enjoy it. Um, and we don't have to use like a calcium product like you do in a, especially if you're using RO water. Um, and so for automated watering, the way I like to set out my outdoors is I like to have a primary system that is uh, usually blue mats are my, my preferred um, just because there's no pumps to break. There's very little maintenance. They're a little tricky the first week or two to get them set up, but once you get them set up, they're, you know, they're pretty low maintenance. Um, and then I generally, I set them to be on somewhat the drier side. And then I go in manually, um, I'm a breeder, so I'm using everything usually for me is from seed. So every plant has a little bit of a different requirement. So I generally set my automated watering a little bit on the drier side, and then I come back and hand water, you know, the ones that are drinking really heavily or the ones that I'm noticing, you know, they just, they just want more than, than the other plants. <clears throat> but with the blue mat system, you know, at least you have where if you're out of town for a day or you can't get to the garden this day or, you know, for whatever reason, at least your plants are going to die in the sun. They'll get, they'll get at least enough to, to keep their roots happy and keep the, the root zone happy. Yeah, you just hit on a couple of things that I want to talk about real quick. Um, so blue mots, I love blue mots or blue mats. Uh, just Google B-L-U-M-A-T-S. Google that. Um, if you're in the U.S., you'll find like one company in particular that supplies them. I forget. Uh, you can even get them. You can get packs of uh, blue mots on Amazon. Um, and you basically just kind of find a system for your whatever you're growing in, uh, like the size of that space. So they'll have Blue Mott systems for like 30 gallon pots, for example, they'll have a specific system. Or you can just get one, um, some of the systems are just like the little carrot things. They're these little clay carrots that have water going over top of them. And once the carrot starts to dry out a bit because the soil around it is drying out, it releases um, a bit of pressure and that allows the water to drip out. And what I've done at home um, on a you know small backyard scale, or even growing in like, um, let's see, I was watering even just a couple pots with blue moths in the past. On a small scale, you could do it with um, a five gallon bucket and you can just buy this little spigot that you drill in the side of the bucket and you have this little tiny tubing. I forget what it is. It's like eight millimeter or something like that. And the water just by using gravity, you put the bucket up, you know, five feet in the air or something like that. And you can have the water coming out of that bucket and, you know, watering a couple plants. If you wanted to do like I was saying earlier and use your like hose from your house or something like that, you can hook that up straight to a pressure reducer that Blue Mott sell sells. And then that goes into, you can get rubber tubing. And I've just snaked that throughout my garden. And that will just water automatically, just like Jeff saying, and which is great. It's so awesome, especially I live in Northern California and especially lately, like last summer, it's been getting super, super hot, like for stretches at a time where it'll get like 90 to 100. And so those days, especially growing outside, like Jeff was saying, and, and you're growing in pots, you'll go through water, water really quickly, even in a, like a 15 or a 30 gallon, especially like a 15 gallon pot and smaller, those will go water through water super quickly. You might have to water those a couple times a day, um, depending on how hot it is where you are. Um, or, and I guess how humid it is. Um, but I really love Blue Mott systems. So I just wanted to jump in and say that because um, I found they'd be super helpful. And then another topic that I noticed that we don't have covered um, that I want to make sure that we touch on real quick is um, what you're growing in soil or whatever. Jeff talked about that earlier in terms of if you're growing directly into the ground. Um, it's helpful to know what you're dealing with. If you're just dealing with clay or some other sort of soil situation that you want to be aware of, like Jeff was saying, you can get a soil test. But if you're going out and filling up pots of soil, um, maybe we can talk about that just super quickly. Um, I myself in California, and now it looks like it through a, a lot of the United States, um, you can get Soil King. I really love so Soil King's um, Big Roots soil. Um, I've used that and it's super uh, good stuff. I also might just suggest going to your local like grow or hydro store, uh, hydroponic store and asking 
um, what the growers there really like um, or what they've had success with. Um, Drag Jeff um, or JR or Flower Reef, do you guys have any thoughts on um, soil and maybe suggestions for how people can make sure that they're growing in good shit and not just buying the like cheapest, you know, compost that you can get at, uh, at Home Depot or whatever. In my opinion, I think, um, if it were me and I'm going outdoors into pots, especially larger pots, um, I'd want to do like a coots mix, uh, from build to soil and have it to where I'm just giving it pH water for the most part. Um, I have seen some of those situations where those soils kind of uh, gas out a little bit towards the end. So you got to top dress a little bit. Um, but as far as ease of use, uh, pre-mixing in the beginning uh, saves you on the back end. Where with, if you don't have a good mix soil, uh, you're going to be feeding it, you know, when you're watering. So, but, yeah. you know, it's just a matter of strategy and and your ability, I mean, if you're in a pretty confined space, it's tough. Or if you're physically limited, it's tough to mix large batches of soil. So like you said, there are some bag soils that you can get that'll kind of give you a medium that you will then eventually have to feed. Totally. That's a great point. Um, I've kind of now had both experiences where um, two years ago, I was well prepared and I used a build a soil kit. Um, that's buildasoil.com. They have uh, nutrient kits and they have like uh, directions on how to mix your soil. Um, but uh, I had followed their directions the first year and it was great. It was just like JR was saying. I just watered it and didn't really worry about it. And it was awesome. Where last year, I was being a little bit too, I don't know what, not paying enough attention. And I just was, um, I just mixed stuff in and then I had to really worry about nutrients later on in flower, especially. Um, so I definitely, this year I kind of learned my lesson. I went back to build a soil. Build a soil is great because you can actually just call them and say, Hey, this is the base soil that I'm using. What nutrient packs do you suggest that I buy to add to it? And they'll tell you how, like how many cups of, of the mix to add to your soil. So I highly suggest them because I literally just did that. I called them and I said, hey guys, I'm mixing six 30 gallon pots. How much nutrients do I mix in You know, per 30 gallon pot? And they told me, so highly suggest them. Um, we just had actually Seattle Chronic just joined in. So that's a great time to get me off the stage and get him on the stage. Welcome, man. Good to see you. Um, we'd love to have you um, introduce yourself, give us a little bit of background, and then I'll throw you a question about growing. For sure. Uh, Seattle Chronic Seeds, name's Rab. Um, I've been doing this 20-ish years or so. Um, <clears throat> Northwest style, but I've worked around in multiple environments. Um, uh, breeding. Uh, growing. Of course, I started off just in a simple closet, moved my way outdoors and um, into facilities. And now here I am today. So um, a great topic to throw at you before we jump into our next set of topics. Um, real quick, I'd love to hear what you suggest for growers that are growing at home in their backyard in terms of pot size, and then how can they find a great soil to grow in and any suggestions around that? Yeah. So, I mean, it depends. I mean, so for first time growers, you could say, you know, going with a larger pot size, a uh, larger plant, but usually it's just to kind of get your things dialed in for the first year and to more so understand the cycle of things, um, pest cycles, things like that, what's going on in your area. So generally what I recommend is just to kind of start small, a um, few plants, you know, uh, start within your plant count um, if you have that pertainable to your you know medical count or whatever it is but i'd say anywhere between four and six plants are manageable between one person um, usually outdoors i think i came on and you were talking about 30s i would say somewhere uh, usually starting between a 15 and a 20 myself um, especially if you're running soil, just to kind of manage the amount it dries out and to be able to um, play around with it a little bit if you're feeding. Uh, but usually for the first time grower, I just say getting some sort of pots, um, running them outside. And then, um, I mean, if you can raise beds, it just makes things a little simpler with blue mats. But I like to be able to kind of adjust and feed towards things. If you're not growing a cover crop, 
um, then you don't really need to run a larger pot size, I feel like. So anywhere between a 15 or a 20 outside, I think for the first time, um, you're not going to get massive plants that way. If you go with 30s, 50s, you're going to get a larger plant, but then that's more to deal with in the end. And a lot of time people you know, put so much consideration in the actual growth that they never look towards the end of the cycle. And, you know, if you're running 30 to 50, you get, you know, a poundish a plant. It's your first time growing and you're having to deal with six pounds. It's, it's a lot to work with, especially dry and getting everything done correctly. Um, so I say start small. Um, I would say usually 15 to 20 gallon pots. Um, I personally use Bio 365 soil. Um, I've used all types of medium and I just find uh, their bio all blend to be um, just a, a nice balance. It's easily tailorable to specific blends. So if you're wanting to create your own, you know, uh, nutrient base for it or adjust it, if you want to run um, cover crops, things like that, it tends to respond really well to it. But um, I played with a lot of different mediums and I tend to like theirs the best. For those out there who are not maybe familiar with cover crops and what that provides for the a rhizosphere, can you kind of speak on that a little bit? Yeah, so basically it's just um, certain plants that we will plant alongside or beforehand um, just to uh, stimulate the rhizosphere. Um, a lot of them also help with uptaking um, nutrient growth as well. So we'll look for certain plants like clover. Um, other plants that, you know, are phosphorus uptaking. Um, I'm just trying to think of the other um, nutrient values as well. But a lot of it, in my opinion, has to do with uh, pests as well. Like I started to learn that um, just different cover crops play in terms of what will attract different bugs as well. So uh, you have to take that into consideration. But essentially, it's just kind of stimulating the soil um, for your plants. And also, a lot of time you'll grow your plants out and then once your plants are in the flower, you'll chop down your cover crop and give kind of a compost nutrient base, throw some compost on top and kind of um, activate a whole new cycle to kind of stimulate the flower growth as well. But that's, that's getting a little ahead of topic. So. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Nice. Thanks so much, man. You covered a lot of great ground there. No pun intended. Um, JR, do you want to kick us off into our next uh, series of topics? Yeah, I think one thing that um, maybe new growers or people who are setting up in their backyard, they might be bringing plants from their indoor garden to outdoors or maybe from a greenhouse to the outdoors. Um, Jeff, can you maybe talk about uh, some of the strategies for uh, getting them through that process? Yeah, so <clears throat> what I like to do personally um, is I like to uh, start – well, first off, you need to consider the light cycle and you need to consider the sun intensity. Those are the two factors. If you go from an 18-6 light cycle or a 24-0 cycle or a 24 cycle and you put them straight outdoors, more than likely they're going to just flower just from the, the drastic shift. So I like to look up the sunrise and sunset of June 1st in your area and I'll set a my timers indoors before I even take them outdoors. I'll set my indoor timers to that time as if they were outside June 1st in your area, which that seems to me at all the times I've done it, it keeps them from wanting to go into flower and then re-vegging as the summer days get longer. Um, and then I also like, uh, especially for a lot of the modern genetics that's been bred by indoor growers that have been babying them their whole lives. You know, a lot of times you'll have to take those and put them in the shade for several days sometimes before you can actually put them into full sun. But generally, I mean, if you watch your plants, you can kind of tell if they're in the full sun and they, they start wilting, they start getting little light burns. I mean, you can tell usually fairly fast if it's too intense for them. And if it is, they go back in the shade and you can kind of extend it a little bit more each time. Um, you know, and obviously the hottest part of the day is when it's going to be the most stressful for the plants. Um, generally, you know, if you can get them into some early morning sun and that early afternoon before it gets to the hottest part of the day, or if you do it the opposite after work, you know, when it's the hottest part of the day is past, you can bring them out into the sun and, you know, gradually increase their sun every day until they're able to be at their final location in the full sun and still be praying. That's that's usually the sign that 
they're ready to go into their final homes. Um, you know, or the other, the other option is you start, start seeds outside earlier in the year under cover and they don't have no transition period whatsoever. Excellent. I think that's a, I think that's important for people to know um, because I think it's pretty common for people to think, Oh, I'll just take these out of my tent and throw them outside and we'll be good to go. And so uh, I appreciate you kind of shedding some light on that subject because I think it's important. Um, also, like you said, uh, early in the season, it might be uh, more of a flowering uh, sun cycle. So you need to augment the, the light cycles with some artificial light just to get them pushed through into the summer as well. Yeah, and usually it doesn't take much. You know, usually it's just a couple of extra hours. Um, you know, you can do it if you don't want to do the June first look up. You can also just give them an hour of light in the middle of the night, and you know that'll that usually will be enough to keep them from going in the flower. And genetics play a huge part in it too. When you're getting seeds from someone that's breeding for outdoor purposes versus someone that's breeding in indoor dialed facilities, those are entirely two different grow styles and environments. Um, and the, the seeds that are made that way will reflect in how they perform. I think that's a big reason why I invited uh, you and Rab, uh, because you guys don't specifically breed for indoor pr uh, products. Um, you breed also for outdoor products. Uh, you also, uh, especially you, Rab, you will uh, not only do THC, high THC varieties, but you also do like type 2 where you got ratios, or you might even have a high CBD strain. Uh, can you kind of speak on the genetics and, 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 and the outdoor acclimation of that? Yeah, I mean, it does play a huge role, and that's kind of um, – I'm glad you kind of brought that to topic too, just because um, me, myself, and Hoku, um, I was actually just over there today, and we were kind of looking through a lot of the stuff that we were uh, running of the CBG, CBD, THCV, uh, different cannabinoid profiles, and just how they kind of respond more to sun, because I run all indoor currently, um, and he has the greenhouses outdoor, and then I'm also doing an outdoor setup with Dutch Blooms this year. Um, so there's like a multitude of environments I'm working in, um, but seeing kind of the stuff that I'd been running indoor and how it runs in, you know, full sun or even greenhouse, it's a completely different morphology. Um, and then just getting it dialed for, you know, greenhouse growing specific people or outdoor specific, um, the nodal structures will be completely different um, from one environment to the next. So it's really important to kind of take those things into consideration. And I mean, even with that, if you're growing from seed, just, you know, kind of have some knowledge as to something that's going to finish fa fast, not have giant thick colas, um, just because a lot of time you'll get bud rot, especially humid areas or things around here that have moisture that come in early season towards September. So um, one of the things I'd say is, Farmer's Almanac is your friend if you're doing outdoor. Like, you need to read that shit every year. Um, something I've always done and been taught as a child, like, it's something to learn your light schedules when, you know, plants should be planted and just to get to understand, like, where your region sits. So, um, yeah, it's super important to understand the, the sun cycle and everything to do with it. But back to cannabinoids. So, um, we kind of have to play a lot with stuff because a lot of stuff with CBG or CBD early is an early variety. And so if you're running a house of mixed ratio stuff, it's kind of cool because you can start bringing down, you know, your uh, CBG and uh, CBD stuff between six, seven, eight weeks. And then, you know, the mixed ratios generally come down between eight and 10. And then a lot of the THCV and CBDV stuff comes down really long. And so it tends to run 12 to 16 weeks. A lot of time you're only able to run them, you know, 12 in greenhouses, but I've kind of been doing supplemental lighting and stuff to where uh, we've been managing to push it up to about 14. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, and so now we've uh, pretty much got everybody set up. They've got a soil. Um, they're in the ground. They're growing. They're growing good. Um, can uh, Flower Reef? Can you maybe talk about uh, some strategies for supporting your plants as they grow? How do you kind of gauge that, and 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 how do you approach that? 
I want to be as natural as possible. I don't like the idea of tying them down or using the net and all that. I feel like it also restricts how I can get in there and move around and like get in the dirt if I need to. So I do a lot of super cropping right now, like just almost a little bit every day, just a little, little bit. So it's like very little stress. And can you I explain what that is real quick? Super yeah, cropping? Sorry. Yeah. So like, just like you just bend, you, you bend the stems without breaking the membrane. So just to, so it keeps them shorter and bushier rather than letting them grow super tall. And you can just do that a little bit every day even, and it really does no damage, but it keeps them shorter and they're still super happy and tall. You don't have to put a net over them. So I'm doing that right now while they're vegging. And then when they start getting heavier and flowering and stuff, I plan on using like stakes to put in the ground and tie them to that rather than keep them completely confined with a net or something. Cause I can move the, I can move the stakes around as I need to. Excellent. Right. Cause how big are the pots that you're typically, because if you're moving plants I'm again, be, I forgot. Yeah, I'm going to be using 10 gallon because okay. I I'm going to have, uh, I believe, just two. I, I don't even know. I have a bunch right now. I don't even know what the whole plan is. But two for sure and some auto flowers. So I just don't want to get ahead of myself because it's just me too. So two doesn't sound like a lot, but at the end, it's a lot. Um, you actually helped us just hit um, one of our... Uh, Viewer questions. Um, Char Billow asked, um, can both auto flowers and photo uh, period plants be grown outdoors? So you just said, yeah, you're growing auto flowers outside. Yeah, absolutely. Auto flowers, they're, they're actually great. So that was the first ones I grew on my own. And I, I royally screwed them up. But the thing is, they're so resilient. I had a problem with bugs. It was my rookie mistake. I sprayed them with a soap mixture while they were in flower. So that totally scented them. Um, but it was spider mites. And because I live in Canada, uh, it was very cool outside. And I think that's where they come from. That's what they say. Uh, I was able to throw them outside overnight. And the bugs were gone like that. Like I didn't have to use a pesticide or anything. So my only fault was like my rookie mistake, not knowing about the soap and them being in flower. So they're so resilient and they'll grow in almost any condition. So growing them outside, you just get that much better results. Yeah, I love auto flowers. Um, I literally just put uh, four seedlings outside just two days ago. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and my strategy there is I'm going to have the bigger plants that I'll har get to harvest in um october but these auto flowers i'll be able to harvest in like july exactly. um yeah I keep turning them over and over and over again and someone who like only has the summer season here in the winter they're great like every 70 days or so it's like boom you have a new harvest so obviously the yield is much less but you can get some really good quality stuff especially like if it's just for you it's crazy not to grow them I hear that. Um, all right, take it away, JR. <laughs> Excellent. So now that we've talked about uh, some of the supporting uh, strategies, um, well, actually, I'd kind of like to get maybe, Jeff, maybe your perspective on that supporting uh, plants and, and strategies uh, for maybe people who are going to be in large pots and doing large plants. Yeah. So for me, for outdoors, I don't, I don't even consider using anything under the, under a hundred gallon. I like to do the big plants. I've got plant counts to worry about. So I try to maximize every single slot that I can. Um, generally I like 200 gallon pots or four by four beds at, at a minimum. And so my style is when I first plant them in the beginning of the year in June, and usually I'm either, I actually try to get in by mother's day. Usually is my goal. Um, and I'll put a smaller inner metal cage. Usually I'll do like a six foot field fence type inner cage that is just slightly outside of the current plant size. Um, and usually by mother's day, um, when I'm growing, they've been started at the very beginning of the year. They're already, you know, two footers usually at least by the time I put them out, if not double that. And so I'll put a six foot inner cage. And then on the outside of the bed or on the outside of the pot, I'll put a eight foot metal cage. And so during the whole grow season all year, I'll be pulling the branches down and through the inner cage and getting them to go the direction of the outer cage. And so then when stretch comes, they go through 
the outer cage and come up and that's your support. Um, I've always grown in climates that have a lot of wind and a lot of rain. Um, and heavy buds, wind and rain is a combination to come out to see plants on the ground and split stems. So I, my, by the way I do it is I like them to have as much support and strength as possible so that if we have a rainstorm or a snowstorm, I mean, that's not unheard of where I was growing in Oregon, um, you know, they have something strong and sturdy that will keep them from splitting. Um, and you don't have to, like, if you're doing smaller, you don't have to do an eight foot cage. Like if you're just doing 30 gallon pots, you know, that can be just a smaller four foot field fence. You know, usually I just roll it around a pot, figure out how long I want it and cut it and, you know, make however many you need um, for the year. And I have a you- quick question on that, Jeff, actually. Uh, sorry to interrupt you because no. I've, 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 I've messed. So I've, I've been messing with this as well as I've been growing outside of my backyard and I, um, I use cattle fencing that I, like, thankfully we have a truck. And so we just went to like tractor supply or whatever and bought like a big ass sheet of, or, or a thing of, um, cattle fencing, but I found it's a pain in the ass to bend that stuff, especially if you want it to be in like a perfect circle around your pot. Do you have any tips for how to make these like cagings kind of fit around your pot or anything like that? If you've learned any sort of tips? Um, unfortunately, I, the, I, what I, that's pretty much what I use too. I use the bison fence, you know, eight foot. Um, I will say it is, it's a two person job to make it easy. What it, I do it myself and it's a nightmare. Um, I will say that it is, it is a pain in the ass. Um, but the nice thing is once they're made, I just leave them on the pots. Once they're on the pot, like they'll stay on that pot for all eternity until I'm not at that spot anymore. Um, and, you know, generally there's there's not really, at least not one that I found. I do like to um, get like pool noodles, like from Dollar Tree or, you know, Walmart. And I do like to put pool noodles on anything that's been cut. Um just because I've had too many cuts on my arms from reaching in and, and getting your, you know, you catch your skin, it, it, that does suck. Um, so that's, you know, kind of my style. And you don't have to use bison fence. I mean, you can, you know, there's, you can use trellis netting, you can use bamboo stakes as well. I mean, there's, that's the cool thing about cannabis is it's pretty, pretty easy going. There's all different ways to do it. Yeah, last year when I had, so I've, I had last year I grew directly in a raised bed into the ground and had plants that had a little bit more sativa in them than, than what I was expecting. And so they were like 12 and 14 feet tall. And so for those, I was using trellis netting and there's actually, um, I forget what their name is. I think their name is like Mr. Green, but there's actually uh, biodegradable trellis netting now that you can buy online. I definitely suggest if you're if you worried about that it's like this um plastic ish netting and i use that to support my plants but like jeff is saying if you're growing in like you know like a 30 gallon pot or whatever i really love that fencing because you can um especially when i had plants that i was like trying to give myself time i would weave the branches through the fencing and that was um kind of doing two things it was giving me more time but also just making sure that that shit was supported because yeah when you have wind and all this stuff and these branches get um big and especially you know you're six weeks into flower those branches are heavy you know and you don't want to be in the home stretch of flower and all of a sudden you've got branches on the ground broken you know yeah and one nice thing too with doing especially if you do an inner and an outer is it lets you know exactly what you have to um, prune off um, like anything in that tight inner cage at all. Like for me, I prune all of that out of there. Um, so you have all the airflow. So it makes it a really easy guide to like what can stay, what nodes you can leave and what nodes should be removed. That's a whole interesting topic right there that I feel like <laughs> would take another time to talk about because JR is always giving me a tough time. He's saying, Man, you gotta clean your clean bottoms. Your, clean your bottoms, man. You can't be always, walking around with a dirty bottom. Yeah, I text him photos. I'm like, look at these giant plants. He's like, you gotta clean your bottoms. I'm like, yeah. Fuck. <laughs> um. So then I t- like clean the shit out of it, and I text him back. I'm like, I did it. Get off my back. Um. Let's see. <laughs> um. Well, so 
let's see. One of the things that I would love to talk about, um, we kind of talked about it a little bit earlier in terms of building soil, but um, could, let's see, anyone can raise their hand to chat, uh, chat about this one, but feeding your outdoor plants, uh, maybe flower reef. How are you feeding your outdoor plants? Are you, are you in a soil that's just kind of water only and you're good to go or are you feeding your plants? Yeah, so I'm doing organic, completely organic. I'm using uh, the Gaia Green Organics. So right now they're just in the organic living soil. So they're good for about four weeks. But I mean, uh, outdoor too, I feel like a schedule kind of goes out the window. I was like, okay, every four weeks or every, like if the soil is good for four weeks and then you're supposed to feed them every week or whatever. Um, but like, just watch your plants. They'll tell you because it's like uh, outside, you water them so much more than you do inside or if it's hotter out today. So I really watch my plants. If it looks like they need something, I feed them. So knowing what they need to really goes a long way. So that's like my best advice is knowing. Um, but to make it easier, I find like the uh, organic is the best way because I just use the living soil top dress every whenever they need it and then water and that's it what are you top dressing with with the with whatever fertilizer so i have uh just i just use worm castings and uh an all-purpose fertilizer right now because they're in veg and that's it nice. and um could you touch base on or touch on a little bit of you said knowing it. So I think in grower terms, you know, one of the things that you learn, uh, cause we have a lot of folks that are now on cannabis that want to learn to grow, right? So as um, the new growers or aspiring growers that are watching right now, you got to learn about your leaf deficiencies. Yeah. The, yeah so could you talk yeah. about that a little bit? Yes. Yeah. So even I still don't know for sure, like if I see it, the leaf, I know there's something wrong, but I don't know right away, oh, it's nitrogen or phosphorus or whatever. I have a, a book, um, but I know at least the leaf, like if it's not perfectly green, whatever color that strain is supposed to be, and if it's not perky, if there's spots or anything right away, I go to my book and I look up what it needs and then I, I give it that. And then I wait a little bit and I, I watch it. And then if it comes back to health, then I did whatever right. If it's doing something else, then something else is wrong. Um, so I really, really had to do my homework first to make sure, like, so that I could just really read it and know what it wanted, if that makes sense. Totally. Um, Rab, I'd love to hear from you. Um, what are your thoughts on, on uh, especially for home growers that are growing in their backyard, what do you suggest for people um, – feeding their plants and keeping them supported? Oh, man. So it just depends on where you're – I mean, if you're going smaller. Um, I mean, I, I can do what I personally would, you know, suggest myself. So uh, running – generally, if I'm doing a cover crop, uh, running a 4 by 4 bed, um, I tend to have the attachments – um, just PCV attachments so you can go acquire tube from Home Depot, modify your cage, and then lay down trellis wherever you need to in between. Um, and then you can just kind of tailor, wrap around if you need to, if it gets too big. But So a lot of time what I'll do is I'll run a cover crop initially to, like we said, uh, stimulate the growth. Um, I'll tend to throw some myco down. Um, when I throw down the cover crop seed, and so that just gives it um, – a little bit more growth, uh, moves a little bit faster. Usually a few weeks into that growing, I'll throw the plants initially in. Um, they'll start growing up. Um, if I need to flower them faster, then I'll throw a dep over it, um, which is just a modified hoop over the four by four bed. And for people that don't know what that means, that's just um, eliminating night. So you're, you're making, uh, not eliminating, but daytime. So modifying the schedule, just pulling a tarp on it, making it a 12-12 if you want to flower it out faster. So that's um, right. I'm glad good. you touched on that because we actually had a question about that later on. So yeah, light deprivation is what people need to look up if they want to learn more about that. A lot, and that's what we do a lot of the time. So it's it's kind of something you'll as you move along with growing, you'll you'll want to modify your schedules and get more into it. But it's just more an advanced topic. So that's but when we refer to you know depping or light depping, that's what I'm talking about. Um, and so in the four by four bed, essentially once the cover crop gets to that certain stage, 
Um, feeding for me, I'll do a little bit of fulvic acid, a little bit of humic acids. Um, my main feeding comes when you chop and drop your cover crop. Um, so usually about three weeks in, two and a half uh, to the start of flower, I'll do a chop and drop. I'll chop all the cover crop that's grown up, uh, drop it on the soil, throw some uh, fish compost or whatever compost you have handy. Um, usually if you just grab some Aldi Mountain, something like that. Compost, worm castings, and then you generally want to cover it with straw. Um, that basically is enough nutrient charge. A lot of times I'll kind of modify, like there's certain uh, powder forms that I'll, I'll use, um, but it's tailoring towards specific plants. And again, it's more an advanced cultivation topic. We're just trying to keep things simple. Um, and so just doing that, covering it, letting it go from there, and then maybe occasionally compost teas, that's a big thing for me, um, is just constantly having uh, a nitrogen fixated, so a poop or whatever fixated tea, uh, alfalfa, alpha, I mean, uh, I, I could go to the base ingredients that I have a list, but uh, generally an N-heavy tea for veg and then uh, generally a transitional tea that's PK-heavy uh, with a little more molasses and sugars for feeding and trichome uh, ripening production. And I also incorporate emos as well. Um, I like to do some crane farming techniques, um, ferments, labs, EM1. Uh, I think as you went over as well, leaf analysis is a huge part, like constantly monitoring your leaves on like a daily basis just to see if you have yellowing, wilting, upward, downward, constantly, if it cline, uh, pests always leave some sort of spotting, marking. So just to kind of stay ahead of the game, you want to monitor your leaf on like, you know, as much as you physically can. Um, and then just kind of let it ride. I mean, the, the first year you're going to kind of encounter a few problems, but it's just making it through the full season, I think, and really, you know, having faith. If you have problems, go online, start researching. Ask. There's plenty of people like myself, um, tons of us on the panel, Cannabis, um, tons of people that will help out, you know, and kind of troubleshoot with you on deficiencies because I know a lot of the time, it's a huge debate, like whether it's, you know, nutrient related or this, it's CalMeg. It's always CalMeg, right? On the internet, it's CalMeg related, like hundred percent. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in a grower. I'm in like multiple Facebook grow um, or grower groups on Facebook. And it's hilarious how many times in the comments, people are just like more CalMeg and they're like legit serious. It's like, what the, it's, every yeah. professional will recommend CalMeg. So yeah. Um, um, yeah. well, let's, I would, so, um, you just touched on a topic that for me is personal as, uh, long time viewers would know I've been, um, hurt by, by bugs in the past. So IPM man, or integrated pest management, we just did a, a video about that. Um, a couple weeks ago with Mary Beth Sanchez, I highly suggest people watch on our YouTube channel or on cannabis, but for our panelists growing outdoors is so challenging right? We, with all these different bugs that are coming from wherever. Um, you know, like the other day I had leaf miners on my lettuce in our front yard and my wife was like, where did these come from? And I was like, we're outdoors, man. They could come from anywhere, <laughs> you know? So um, Rab, I would love to hear what you suggest for defending your plants in, um, let's start in veg. So, you know, people are watching this video, they're gonna be growing these plants in Ju through June and July. How can they protect their plants through that period of time? Um, usually having a, a particular uh, deterrent spray um, that you're just out constantly spraying, something that's environmentally friendly um, and that does not harm bees or any other animals. Um, so that's something you generally wanna look into. Um, but just something like uh, for KNF or oriental herbal nutrients generally based out of uh, repulsive things that insects hate. They're just fermented and then sprayed on the plant continuously. So they, along with having, you know, companion plants or banker plants, which are just um, plants that attract other pests. Uh, so it, it's just becoming familiar with like what are the most common pests in your territory. And so. A lot of time we have problems with aphids up here. I think we all do, right? I mean, it's just like a huge thing. I know we deal with it in multiple regions, but it's just common and they're nasty up here. And so just having something around that they like more so than cannabis. So having one other plant 
that they might like. Um, same with mites. Mites love clover. So if you're running a clover cover, uh, cover crop, that's one thing I always like to tell people um, who run tons of clover is like you want to get that down before the three week mark, because if you're going to do it at three weeks of flower, you're going to be noticing webbing, you know, week six or seven. And then that's a good tip. Be, so um, yeah. it's just having researching what attracts pests that are familiar with cannabis and trying to deter them from your plants. Um, spraying like if you if you're just having to go to a store and buy something like Lost Coast Plant Therapy, uh, Doctor Zymes, um, all they have pretty clear labeling. They can be used in light dilutions to heavy infestation dilutions, and they're environmentally friendly for the most part. Um, I would just recommend using something simple, spraying a few times a week, and just keeping an eye on things. Um, I like to have um, other. Beneficial insects, which is a huge thing, is just to have insects that will fight off um, constantly having ladybugs, mantises, uh, lacewing, lacewing larvae, ladywing larvae, or ladybug larvae. Uh, just constant rotation of things will keep your plants uh, defended from aphids and everything else that are bad. It's, but it's just being, I mean, having a huge offense because you're going to get them regardless. If you're putting plants outside, it, there's no way you're not going to get bugs. I mean, unless the plant has some su superior genetic defense that, you know, needs to be held tightly, um, you're going to have to be out defending your plants and having some sort of, you know, pesticide to them. So totally. I don't like using that word necessarily, but just some sort of defense because it's not necessarily all killing pests, but just deterring them from your plants. Um, we just got a great question from Northern Grower that I'm going to hit you with, Reb, and then I'm going to tag in Flower Reef. But um, uh, Northern Grower on our YouTube page just asked, um, what plants can you plant that re repel harmful bu bu bugs? Sorry. Oh, man, you're going to have to. If he wants to shoot me a DM, I will be happy to send him a list. I have files of things, so I kind of record these things. But just off the top of my head, I have so much on my mind. I probably would yeah. give you the wrong information now, and I don't want to do that. So, uh, yeah, if you just want to shoot me an email at seattlechronicseeds at Gmail, I can send you a list of uh, beneficial based on regions or, you know, what pests you're looking to defend from. So. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, Flower Reef, I want to touch base with you. So how how are you um, defending your plants through the vegetative cycle? So say uh, Dr. Bronner's, that's the one I use, the soap. So I don't remember the exact mixture, but it's a mixture of Dr. Bronner's and water. And then I spray them about once a week. Like I watch them. And yeah, again, they're outside. So it's more, it's completely preventative. I understand there's going to be bugs. So it's it's to prevent like an infestation or prevent a problem. Uh, and that seems to work really good. They're healthy. I don't have to worry about the stuff going in the ground because again, it's completely organic. Uh, so in this stage, you can just give her and so far so good. Like they're all so healthy and happy and yeah, so far so good with the bugs. And again, your environment, you don't want like, if you create a space with too much humidity or too much heat, if you create a space for bugs, they're going to come. So if you're aware of what they don't like, then chances are you won't get them if you're able to create that space. Interesting t tip there. I wanted to, um, so Rab just um, mentioned uh, Dr. Zyme. So this is what that bottle looks like if you go to like the grocery store or whatever. Um, they were our sponsor last month, so thanks to them. Um, and you can check out Mary Beth Sanchez from Dr. Zymes. We interviewed her just a couple weeks ago, so check that out. We talked all about integrated pest management. Um, the other spray that I really like that's kind of similar, it's kind of like a competitor to Dr. Zymes, is Tweetment. Uh, Tweetment is... Um, more mint based. I think uh, Dr. Zymes is more like citrus based. Tweetment is more mint um, water or like a, a mint uh, concentrate based. And uh, both of those are great. And both of those you can use both in veg and flower. Um, so anyways, Jeff, I want to talk because you were just before you jumped on the stream, you're just talking about how you just deal with everything uh, where you're at. So how I want to, I feel like you're the veteran here that can get us through flower. If anyone can get through flower, you can get through flower. So <laughs> how, how are you um, defending your plants from molds and pests and all this stuff when you're in those eight, 10 weeks of flower? 
Yeah, I mean, you guys went over some of the products that I that I really like. Um, I do KNF, so I do you know the OHNs and Lab and FAA, which are a deterrent. And <clears throat> um, I'm a fan of Zymes as well, Lost Coast, um, Serenade, Regalia, Grandivo. Those are all um, you know products that are be safe and if used properly are are safe for for flowering um and for you know consumption um i mean the biggest thing is you got to be on it you got to put the work in um you, you you just have to you have to be out there spraying you have to be out there if you are noticing leaves that are getting damaged removing them removing any leaves that have that that are infested with aphids or mites i mean that's all stuff that needs to get pruned out um you know the biggest the biggest thing is you got to put the time in on your garden um if you let it slip a day, a week, they don't stop. Like they're out there having a happy breeding, eating, um, pooping in your flowers. I mean, this is all uh, any day that you give them to establish will make it that much harder to get rid of them. Um, you know, that's, that's the biggest thing. Um, and it's also an understanding that especially the more garden space you have, the more things you're going to see um, outdoors, that's just part of farming. It's part of um, part of doing it. So you just got to really learn the signs, learn the early signs and be in the garden enough to notice that those signs are coming in um, and then implementing a plan that will, um, you know, be able to hit them from as many different layers i mean that's that's the biggest thing is you don't want to use the same product every week you want to you want to hit them with as many different avenues um and if you start researching the products you find that there are certain uh, methods of how they kill like lost coast and zymes those are both contact killers so that means you have to thoroughly spray every single inch any any little spot on the leaf that you leave that you leave them living that's their foothold. All you're doing is creating more work for yourself. You know, you really have to be able to be able to use it properly and understand how these products are working so that you can apply them properly and then developing a, a, a plan and a schedule to do it. Um, like for outdoor full term, I would say during stretch, um, one of the most important in every area that I've ever grown is using BT to get the caterpillars before you have flowers because that's when the moths are laying their eggs. The, the cat, by the time you see the caterpillars, I mean, that's, it's too late. You should have sprayed two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Um, so it's really, you know, there's certain, especially for full term, there's certain like uh, schedules that you really have to have to keep in order to, to get yourself to the end. You just hit on my hot button topic because I have lost so much weed to fucking caterpillars i hate them so um i asked mary beth sanchez about caterpillars and she was basically saying like uh you can only spray so much or whatever these moths are uh, like i live in northern california and i'm seeing moths and caterpillars like um probably late august through october i'm mm -hmm. seeing them all the time and so basically what she said is you just have to put mosquito nets over your plants and that wasn't something that I've seen. I don't see like the big outdoor growers in NorCal covering their 14 foot plants with mosquito nets. So I was kind of curious what you suggest. How can you really defend yourself from caterpillars? Um, well, what I, the other thing I like to do is bug zappers. Um, you know, if you put a few bug zappers out, not, not in your greenhouse, cause you don't want to be attracting them to your greenhouse, but you know, like 50 foot away or 50 foot away from your grow space, um, you know, those, the moths love those little blue lights in a bug zapper and, you know, that'll do a lot to, to kill the adults. Um, and unfortunately the other, the other method is using your eyes and tweezers or your fingers and pulling them out, cutting any area that, that they were pooping in because any poop left in the flower, I guarantee you the first rain is going to be mold. Um, so, you know, you just want to cut that out and nature takes her cut of your crop i mean that's that's part of part of the part of it i don't think you can ever be a hundred a hundred and ten percent free of them i just i just don't think that's possible not unless like you're using cars that are so hazardous that you wouldn't want on your cannabis 
Yeah, I think you brought up a point about detecting, um, like in the case of the caterpillar, uh, where it'll burrow itself in there and start shitting. Uh, a lot of times it'll be like a leaf or a little mm -hmm. brown area, and you pull it out, and if it's slimy at all, you need to immediately cut out mm -hmm. that area because, like you said, that shit's just going to spread botrytis all mm -hmm. the way through, and then it's just going to be a rot situation. Well, yeah. It's better to take your loss early than yep. let it go, and then you're losing so much more. Yeah, you have to really be on top of it. Even without rain, you'll get bud rot. Because I, you know, I in California we don't get rain anymore. It seems like so. Even without the rains, like Jeff was saying, um, you'll still get bud rot, and it's really difficult. I hear what you guys are saying in terms of finding them, but it can be really difficult because sometimes those caterpillars are really, really tiny. And what they like to do is they climb in through a bud. Usually, you'll have your say my arm is like a cola, and the, this is the top. They'll usually come in like right around here and then climb their way up and uh it sucks because you'll you'll like uh jr saying they'll you'll see that one nug and then if you're not on top of it they'll climb all the way up top through the whole thing and then, then it's just full of bud rot and those spores those mold spores will spread and so you have to be really careful about that stuff um i don't know any other panelists want to chat about um ipm before we move on um to our other topics let's see no one's a taker so uh jr do you wanna let's see take us into our next let's see we'll get you unmuted oh we might have lost jr for a second um there we go maybe J jr is uh reconnecting i think um so let's see we have covered so many different topics thanks for everyone who's watching thanks to our panelists i know we're a little um over an hour now so i really appreciate all of your time um there's jr i think he's back jr are you there nope all right can you hear me <laughs> now we can yeah yeah okay um, excellent yeah, Go so um, one of our last, last topics, uh, harvesting and drying. Because uh, like you said, you, you know, you pull off these uh, six 20-gallon plants, you're going to have some poundage. So what are some good strategies for people who maybe don't have environmentally perfect rooms to dry in? What are some uh, things that they can do to help get a successful harvest? Um, I'll let you start with that one, Rab. Yeah, that's that's a pretty easy one. So um, for those that are first-time growers, I recommend buying a growing tent um, and using that to dry in. Um, probably the smartest thing is just to kind of base it on the size that you're putting out. But um, just, yeah, buy a grow tent, line it up. Um, you can either string up at the top of it or use the bars, the frames they have set up on the top. Um, a lot of the time, I'll run multiple layers of string um, around and then kind of layer it so I have multiple layers to be able to hang down everything. Um, and you can easily fit, you know, five, six pounds in a, you know, eight by eight tent. So it's not any issues. Um, I've always had pretty good luck dialing in humidity. Uh, you can, you know, add fans, just get an outlet outside of it, add as many fans, air conditioning inside of it. Um, usually I like to keep it about 60, 60 for 21 days is my curing time. Um, tends to re retain the terpenes. Um, nice amount of dryness to where it's crisp, but not like break apart. It's still dense and has a little bit of moisture to it. Um, it's just a low and slow way. A lot of times I'll up it to like 64, 65 if I'm going, you know, 14 week cycles and trying to produce at a faster rate. Um, like if you need flour, you can up it. Just try not to, you know, have crazy like 77 heat and 30 humidity or vice versa, because then your flour is going to come out smelling completely awful and all that work that you put into it is pretty much trash. I mean, you'll still get the high from it, but it's like getting the full end spectrum of what you did. You need those terpenes. So fight for them. Yeah, uh, Flower Reef, let's hear um, from you. I'd love to hear what's your um, drying and curing strategy for your outdoor. <clears throat> so I absolutely do not have one. 
I haven't completely gone through a full cycle and cured it myself yet. So last year, uh, like where I was working, we had a space for it. It was in a garage, so they were fully equipped. So for someone just doing it at home, I mean, if you're not concerned about the smell, any room in your basement would probably do if you're able to control the temperature and the humidity and if you have the patience. Uh, so I just harvested a small autoflower not that long ago. Like, I didn't even let it cure. I already smoked it all. So I am the worst person asking about patience and letting your stuff sit and wait for it because I, I didn't. That's okay. I'm not. Um, I'm not judging because I'm. I'm in the same boat. Because usually it's either that or, you know, spending a couple hundred dollars on, uh, on weed at the dispensary. Um, so yeah. yeah, I hear you on uh, not waiting for the cure part. Uh, sometimes. Um, let's see, uh, Jeff. Let's tag you in here. Let's. How? What do you suggest for uh, drying your outdoor harvest? Yeah, I mean they. The numbers that he uses are the numbers that I shoot for, 60, 60. Those are the magic. Um, for outdoor, when you're doing a big crop, um, especially in tougher climates, the way I would usually do it is I would stagger several harvests. Um, usually I'd pull the tops off of whatever is the most ripe when, it's t when they're ready, and I'd let some of the inner stuff kind of finish so that you kind of have, have almost a revolving door coming out of your outdoor and into your dry room, and then as stuff is drying um usually the scale that i'm at uh usually after the dry room it's going into um, totes to start curing and to await trimming um, it's usually how we do it or i do it um, so once it's in totes i treat that as a jar um, and i burp it you know the same way that you would you know burp your jars every day um, especially for that first seven to ten days you feel like the jar is getting wet again well then it comes back out um you know and for that i have like hanging mesh um dry racks in case i mean that's not what you want you want it to be dried right the first time but sometimes you know if things get too wet again um because that's what's happening when you're curing is the inner moisture is coming out um so if it feels like your jars are getting wet again that's you know that's time to to let it air out a little bit again um you know, and then for the outdoor, you know, usually the way it goes, especially in Oregon where I was at, is, you know, you have this nice, okay, you pull up some tops, you filled it. Oh, crap, weather's coming. Oh, no, real weather is coming. It's time to, it's time, okay, what has to come down? What can't go through this storm? Um, and then it's all hands on deck, getting it as hung as fast as you can before the storm hits. If there's stuff that... You know, especially for me, because I do the mold and mildew resistant stuff um, with all different flower times. I've kind of, you know, planned my garden accordingly to that so that, you know, if there's a storm the first week of October. Well, I have stuff that might be not quite ready yet, but it's not so far in that, you know, it can't take six days of rain. Um, it really comes down to knowing your strains, knowing, you know, what your dry space is. Um, so a lot of times, at least, you know, for me, the dry space will be full. Sometimes you wish you could take some stuff, but you know, there's only so much space. You just kind of got to roll the dice and, you know, see what the genetics are made of. Awesome. Well, that brings us to our, um, questions from our viewers then that I want to uh, make sure that we bring in. So, um, this next question, I'll throw to uh, Rab over at Seattle Chronic Seeds. Um, we had a question from um, OU812 or 812. He, uh, they asked, here's my question. How do I pick the proper strain for my re region and how important is that? And they said they live in a hot and humid environment. So maybe that's a good one for Jeff later on too. But I would love to hear um, from you, uh, Rab. What are your thoughts on how, how can someone at home, how do they figure out, like, am I growing something that is the right, is the right thing for where I'm, I'm living and growing? Absolutely. Um, so a lot of it is just going through trial and error through the first year and whatever makes, I mean, so taking clones is a super important thing. I don't know if you guys touched on that, but it's like anytime before I'm going to put anything outside, you got to take copies of it um, just to have its backups. And so you have those waiting especially once you're doing trials on things. Um, so you kind of can document and then determine whether or not you want to keep them or get rid of them. And so a lot of time what we do 
is we'll put the things outdoors that we're going to test for the cycle and the things, you know, that do extremely well under, you know, 110 degree weather for three days, we'll keep under notation and then run those in hotter environments. So I'll take cuts of those and send them to my friends who are in Arizona, test them down there. If they do good, then that's when generally they'll come back to me and then I'll start making reproductions and having those. And so a lot of time it's just going through this, the cycles of actually like putting your plants to the test and knowing firsthand or having somebody reputable um, that has clones, you know, that says, Hey man, these have done really well in hot environments are looking for seeds that say that as well, but it's just really growing everything out. Um, if you're doing it from seed, um, that's the best thing. Like I said, just take a clone of it before you put it out. Um, keep notes of everything, like what does well against bugs. Um, and if it does good in multiple, you know, faucets, it's not just one thing, like it does well against heat bugs and it produces massive resin, then you might just have a breeding plant on your hands. So yeah, just keep notes and keep copies of everything. Awesome. Um, Jeff, let's bring you in. Uh, so I said the, so um, I can't remember if you said this earlier, but you're out in Hawaii. So the reason um, I thought of you and uh, when they, the question asker said hot and humid, um, you live in a hot and humid environment. Um, how, what are your suggestions besides, you know, of course, looking up some dragon's flame genetics? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I say part of it is doing research um, you know, especially nowadays, there's forums filled with growers from almost everywhere, you know, so same as with any gardening is, you know, find out from gardeners in your area, what strains have worked well for them. Um, find out, do some research on breeders that might be in your area or research breeders that, you know, anyone that's doing it with any integrity should be able to tell you what strains of theirs would be the best choices to, you know, try to find your keepers for your exact microclimate. Um, you know, and that's, you know, that's the biggest thing is, is, so is, is vitally important, especially when you're in a tough climate, not everything is going to work in every climate. That's just the reality, especially nowadays when so much of the seed market is based on cookies. Um, you know, that's not cookies does not do good in harsh climates. Let me just go ahead and tell you that right off the bat. So that's, you know, it's, a lot of it is just doing the research. And then, um, like Seattle Chronics said, running them yourself, running, you know, get your recommendations from a few breeders that you have, you know, researched and built some respect for and, you know, inquire with them and see, get some recommendations, run their recommendations and see how they do. Pull cuts, keep them around. They do good for you. And if you, uh, they really do good, maybe breed with them. You know, that's, that's, that would be my advice. So uh, of your lineup that you have available right now, what would you recommend for people growing outdoors in the northern area? Um, so in the northern area, my first recommendation is always Dragon Stash. Um, it'll take what nature will throw at it, um, especially Oregon, Washington, Vermont, Canada. Um, that's always recommendation number one. Uh, my Missy Stash is another uh, very hardy outdoor line. Um, last I heard it was setting turf records in Massachusetts as well. Um, and for someone that's willing to go to a sativa, the Yunin dragon, um, is virtually bulletproof outdoors, mold, mildew, extreme humidity, extreme rain. It doesn't care. Um, for the most indica thing that I have, that would be of, uh, mold and mildew resistance. I'd say that's the celestial dragon. Um, you know, it's a really fast flower and heavy yielding. Um, you know, broadleaf based um, with, you know, nice gas terps that'll take, uh, take what nature throws. Perfect. Beautiful. That's good information. Uh, Rab, can you kind of speak on to some of the varieties you have available that would work really good outdoors? Stuff I've been doing is going to be um, cannabinoid or one-to-one. -one. Um, a lot of that was done outdoors or is influenced more towards uh, quicker flowering times or powdery mildew resistance. But um, a lot of the new uh, stuff we've been working on is just kind of taking some of the new hype flavors um, and cuts out there and then adding more cannabinoids and powdery mildew resistance to them and trying to shorten the flower time so that they can be enjoyed by all um, along with a full spectrum profile. So I believe those are actually headed out here to uh, Seeds Here Now for a drop here shortly. 
Excellent. Excellent. So, um, Flower Reef, I'd love to hear from you um, with respect to what you suggest people, um, you know, given right now as a recording, if you're watching this in the future, we're recording this on May 22nd, right? So it's getting towards the, people are starting to think about putting plants in the ground, um, at least in North America. Um, so if people are thinking about, they're watching this and they're inspired by you and everyone watching, which by the way, people have loved your your honesty and your comments. So uh, shout out to that, that's oh, awesome. Um, but uh, uh, anyways, what do you suggest for the growers at home? Uh, should they start with seed? Should they start with clones? And if they wanna do that, how do they, how do, they do that? So hard. Again, so many things. Always ask questions first. Um, here in Canada, you never know. This is a wild year. It's not even June yet, and it's been 30 degrees every day here. So, like, you'd think I'm in California, too. This is not normal. So, normally, I'd say start all your stuff in, like, before April. And then as soon as you know there's no more signs of frost, put your stuff outside. But even then, I mean, that could be now or that could be in the middle or the end of June around here. You never know. So like just, again, being knowledgeable, knowing where you live, knowing what the ground is like, knowing what kind of plants do well, like just read. read. I can't knowledge is power. I can't say that enough. Read, read, read as much as you can. And trial and error. Like if I lose a plant, if anything, it's a, it's a learning experience. All the plants I lost just not that long ago, like I could have been really upset, but I learned a lot from it. So just keep trying, keep trying. I love that perspective. Yeah, I, I, um, I agree with that. And, and for um, those that are watching at home, if you're, I guess, fortunate enough to live in maybe recreational market or even a medical market or states, and if you have a medical card, um, your dispensaries might carry clones. And so clones are a great way to start, especially if they have genetics that you're excited about. Um, it's uh, Jeff just kind of touched on this earlier, but I recently got a clone of um, forbidden, it's uh, forbidden Skittles times runs. And so that's going to be something that I hit up the, uh, the growers um, the clone providers, it's Purple City Genetics. And I hit them up and I said, hey, do you guys have any suggestions for growing this outdoor in Northern California? And they said, um, you know, this is more of an indoor variety. So if you're in a place where it gets really hot, it'd be nice to grow it on pots so that you could put, put those pots underneath shade or something like that. So that's not really a scenario that I'm going to be in, but I'm still going to kind of figure out where can I put those, those two pots that for those two clones in my yard that has maybe a little bit more shade or not as much like direct sun all day or whatever it is, just to help give them a little bit of reprieve. And that's that's kind of that's specific to those genetics i guess but anyways i um you know being fortunate enough to live in california where they have kind of a little bit more robust of like a clone market so to speak you can find some good clone companies or cl companies that are, have reputable clones where you know what the genetics are that they're selling that it is what it is like it is what they're saying it is you know because that's one of the things that really frustrates me when you go to some dispensaries and you look at their clones and they're telling you what they are but like where did they get this where did this clone come from what was that original plant is this actually og kush or is this actually cookies or gelato or is are you just telling me it's gelato like i want to know that i'm growing gelato if that's what you're telling me you know what i mean um so those are some suggestions for the viewers that i wanted to throw out there um especially for new growers i think clones are great just definitely look into them and then um you know a whole new other topic is about you know, making sure that you're getting them from a place that doesn't have bugs everywhere, or you're buying clones from a place where the clones actually look happy in the place where you're buying them from. They don't all look like sad and yellow and, and shitty, because um, I've seen that as well um, at dispensaries. Um, so any, another question that I wanted to um, bring in from our viewers, and um, I actually don't have someone in mind for this one, so anyone can jump in on this. Uh, this question is from the American one. How late do you all think you can plant cuttings or seedlings outside in North America and still end up with a viable harvest or at least good smokable material? So who would love to take that one? I'll have to unmute you, so you might have to waver or, or whatever if anyone's... Nope. <laughs> 
Um, Seattle Chronic, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, so generally, um, I mean, I would say depending on your cultivar, I mean, it's really depending on the flowering cycle. You want to give it four weeks to veg. Um, so I would say June, you're kind of in the heat wave already. I mean, you want to be planted, you know, probably before the end of June if you have to. I've done it into July. You just want to have earlier flowering varieties um, or the ability to be able to pull uh, tarp. So, I mean, if you can do that and set up a depth cloth, then you're fine. Um, doing stuff in July and doing late planting, uh, staggering planting as well. But I would say uh, no later than June, most likely. Awesome. Um, and then another question, and I think we're pretty much out of community questions. Um, this next question was about hemp pollen. So this is a question that comes up is, am I, am I going to get pollen from my neighbors? And I'll say this with my window kind of open right now. So I have to be a little bit quiet, but I think I've gotten pollen from my neighbors. Um, because they, he's like two years ago, he was like, yeah, I think one of them was a male and I got some seeds, but that was cool for me. Cause I wanted more seeds. And then I'm the next door neighbor. And I'm like, that wasn't, that wasn't cool, man. Like make sure that you're growing females out there. I don't want pollen. So, um, oops, sorry. I just hit my mic, but does anyone want to jump in about like pollen drift and do I really need to worry about pollen from hemp fields or whatever it is? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not so much anymore now that things have dialed in on the genetic market. So, uh, years ago there was a huge problem with the hemp fields to where, Basically, there were so many people trying to get in the game and sell fake genetics that there was tons of fem seed sold off and huge lawsuits and you know followed. But um, you had to in the past. I wouldn't say as much now, um, but if you do have neighbors who are growing, I would just be aware. Um, that way, you know who to blame if you have seeds in your shit at the end. <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, I, the genetics have come a long way. People have stabilized things. People have COAs. They've built trust with farms over the past few years. And so I think a lot of the shady people are kind of weeded out. Not necessarily. Some people will still grow regular seeds, throw them outdoors and have no idea. Um, so yeah, make sure to sex your plants before you put them outside or know the sex of them. Or if you put them outside and they're a male with balls, pull them. <laughs> Do not pollinate stuff because you have neighbors. So um, if you are going to try and pollinate, uh, do it in a cloth, that, something that you can move, move it away sealed. Uh, a lot of time if I do outdoor pollinations, I'll have an actual bag that I'll have the pollen in, like a one-gallon bag, and I'll do branches at a time. Uh, I'll spray all my other plants, kind of water them off just to make sure that they don't get contaminated as well. Um, but I don't just go out there with a the male and start waving them around because you're going to piss a lot of people off. So. Awesome. Well, um, I think that pretty much covers all of our bases that we wanted to um, cover today. So I want to thank all of our panelists. Um, if you're watching at home or watching live or even in, in the future, watching back on YouTube, let's give everyone applause for um, participating today. And um, also thanks to our viewers, um, our Cannabis fam that hit us up with questions in the lead up to this live so that we can ask questions. And also just thank you to our panelists for their time today. They've spent um, an hour and a half today on a Saturday hanging out and teaching everyone about growing. So um, we're gonna have each one of you give us a shout out. Um, we'll start out with Flower Reef. Um, let's give a shout out to your cannabis and anywhere else people can follow you and anything else that you wanna give the viewers a shout out. Oh, okay, well, here's Flower Reef on Cannabis. This uh, platform is awesome, by the way. I'm loving it. And I'm just on Instagram, so Flower Reef 420. Flower Reef underscore 420 on Instagram. And that's it. And again, I am not very experienced. I'm, like, pretty much winging everything. I don't claim to know anything, really. Uh, it's just all, it's all about the experience for me. It's a lot of fun. And I hope everybody else enjoys it just as much as I do. We appreciate your perspective. For sure. Thank Thanks. you so much for joining us. Thanks. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Jeff, let's have you um, plug your your site, your where people can follow you, and, and anything else. 
Yeah, so my website is dragonslamgenetics.com. Um, you can find my work, uh, merchandise, all that on my website. Um, and then we also have uh, quite a slew of vendors these days. Uh, Neptune, Canada Seeds, Well Grown Seeds, Great Lake Genetics, Frosty Flowers, um, Chai Life Genetics is carrying us right now. Making sure I don't leave anyone out here. Uh, Great Lakes. Um, yeah, there's a, there's quite a few vendors that carry our work and, I uh, want to give them a shout out for, you know, working with us and, uh, always a big shout out to our testers that are, you know, following through. It's always hard to find good testers. And so the ones that, the ones that follow through and help us, uh, learn more about our genetics, that's, you know, that's always a, you know, information is power. And so we really appreciate everyone and obviously everyone buying our seeds and, uh, posting photos and smoke reports. That's, uh, you know, we couldn't do this without you guys. So thanks. Thanks, Jeff. And then last, but certainly not least, uh, let's hear from you, Rab. Uh, where can people, oops, there you go. Where can people find more about you and, and everything else? Uh, so of course, cannabis, Seattle chronic seeds on cannabis first and foremost. Um, I'm also on Instagram. Uh, Seattle Chronic Seeds as well, pretty much any platform, and that's what it's going to be. Uh, vendors right now, Seeds Here Now, um, Neptune, The Seed Connection, Golden Ticket, Seed Bank, uh, Hoku Seed Co. Uh, for CBD, CBG, one-to-ones, uh, Chi-Town Seeds. I'm trying not to forget anybody else as well. Uh, Regenerative Seed Co. as well. Um, and I have a bunch of new stuff heading out to Seeds Here Now and Dagadot Love. So, Awesome. And then JR, I'll give you a chance to give some shout outs as well. Well, um, you can find me at Cannabuzz and you can find me on uh, Instagram at uh, JR Token. Um, and I really want to thank everyone for their time, especially the panelists, members. I really appreciate you uh, helping us further our community with knowledge and like uh, you just got done saying knowledge is power and so when we share these platforms and we share amongst each other we lift each other up and we build each other stronger and for that i'm grateful and i appreciate your time growers love yep thank you so much well said jr token thank you so much to everyone who's watching at home um Again, Cannaba is, is supported by viewers like you. We have a membership system. Um, please check it out if you'd love to help us keep this thing going every month. And we're, we have prizes that we give away every month. We'll be giving away some Irie Genetics seeds at the end of this month. So if you want to become a Cannabis Premium or Associate Producer member, sign up today and you'll be entered into that drawing. Um, and we just really appreciate everyone's support. We just had our first... Um, just in the last couple of days, we had our first second months of subscription. So it means a lot for people to, you know, pay us every month like that. I really, really do appreciate that. It's a big, I know it's like a, a leap of faith with us because we've just launched it and, and everything, but I really appreciate it and it helps support us a lot. Um, but that's it. Thank you so much for everyone who's watching. I hope you have a great rest of your day, a great weekend, happy growing, good luck. And if you need anything, just jump on to Cannabis, join some growers groups, ask some questions. We're all here to help you. But thanks everyone and have a great rest of your day. Peace everyone. Thank you so much for watching this video from Cannabuzz. I'm Q Grows, the co-founder at Cannabuzz. Behind me is my dog, Josie, and we really appreciate your time today. If you had a great time with this video or you appreciated the knowledge that was shared, please give it a like. Please share this video or other videos from Cannabuzz with your friends, and definitely do check us out on the web at cannabuzz.app or search Cannabuzz in the App Store or the Google Play Store and join the Cannabuzz community. We are well over 100,000 community members and you can even become a supporting member so that you can help make more content and help support this community directly through our Cannabis Premium and Associate Producer memberships. That helps support this community directly and helps us keep creating this content. So give us a like, a share, a sign up for Cannabis, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks all.